Dave. It's good to be with you here again this afternoon. Um, I know one thing about that meal that I ate, I ate too much. <laughs> Which means that it was very good and appreciate it so much. The title of my sermon this afternoon is Eye to Eye with Jesus. In the last week of the Lord's brilliant life, He chose to spend it in the city which had often rejected Him, which was Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 13, verse 34, it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often I will gather thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. The Lord says. Here the Lord seeks solace in the house of God, the temple. But He doesn't find any solace there. He's attacked on every side. Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 7 says, God told Ezekiel, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Here in that temple is where the, even the devil continues to relentlessly assault him. You know, we often hear the Lord was tempted in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. That's true. But he was never, the never, devil will never stop attacking, attacking him. Because in verse 12 of chapter 12, it says these words, And they, meaning the Jewish leaders, sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. They were still, the devil was still there, trying to attack him. And here, in that beautiful temple, all of Judaism would come to worship the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That magnificent temple, a very large building surrounded by a larger courthouse. They'd even built it, leveled a mountain, leveled off the top of a mountain to build that temple. It was covered, the stone edifice was covered with gold and precious stones and it shone in the sunlight. Thousands would be thronging around inside that temple, offering sacrifices, saying prayers, burning incense. In the midst of that crowd, who's there but walks the Son of God? Malachi chapter 3 verse 7 prophesies, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come with, saith the Lord of hosts. And earlier that same week, the Lord had come to the temple and cleansed it for the second time of the money changers. In Mark 11, verse 17, Mark says, And he taught and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So there he was. And then the temple you had, as you went into the magnificent doors they had there, there was the court of the women and the court of the Gentiles. Then you had the court of the men. Then you had what we think of as the temple where the, all the temple furniture was. There in the court of women, History tells us there were 13 chests, big wooden chests. And it had a lid shaped like a funnel where they would come and pour their offerings in, their contributions. But all those people there, who knows how many, were there pouring in their contributions, did not know who was watching them at that very moment. They were being observed by, the, the Bible calls it, the giver of all good things. Brother, next time we contribute, maybe if someone contributes today, I don't know, but we need to think about who is there when we contribute. The Lord is there. And we need to examine this passage, Mark chapter 12, verse 11, 41 through 44, and learn about giving as if the Lord was watching us. One thing we need to set out, that giving is an act of worship. You know, sometimes we think that giving is something, well, we do that to kind of keep the, the air conditioner running and the doors open, you know, that sort of thing. But it's much more than that. It's an act of worship. Under the law of Moses, the Jews were automatically required to give, to tithe, as they called it, 10% uh, to God, but they gave much more, and really these... Uh, what we talked about those chests 
was for those who gave besides that, contributing. Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, And all the tithe of the land, God said, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's, it is holy unto the Lord. And the Lord noticed when they did not tithe as they should. In Malachi, book of Malachi again, chapter 3, they had brought him all these sacrifices and, and gifts. Uh, they would bring sacrifices. The, the animals were, were lame and, and, uh, and sickly. And the Lord told Malachi, Will a man rob God? And you have robbed me. But you say, How many have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you have cursed, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now let's be clear, under the New Covenant, the New Testament, we as Christians are not, N-O-T, commanded to tithe. We are commanded to give. We are commanded to give. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. Paul tells the church at Corinth, he writes, he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order, notice that, given order, commandment, to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. Brethren, giving is just as much an act of Christian worship as any other thing is. Singing praises to God, partaking of the Lord's Supper is just as much an act of worship. And we as Christians should worship God as He directs. John 4 verse 24. Worship God in spirit and in truth. And we see that truth and that spirit when we read the New Testament. How they gave. Like in Corinthians chapter 16, 1 and 2 that I just quoted a moment ago. We see how they, <clears throat> how they worshipped, how they offered prayers, how they sang, how they gave exhortation. They gave in the Lord's Supper. All that is the truth that God would have us to worship Him by. But giving is only one act of and is only one act of worship. But it's an act of worship that we determine before, or we should, before we even arrive here. Over in Mark Matthew, rather, chapter six, the Lord says in verse one about giving. It says, Take heed that ye be not that uh, ye do not your alms or your benevolence, whatever, before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your heaven, oh, Father, which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy right left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. We should determine that well before we arrive here. Now sometimes there are things happen, you're not able to do that. But giving is very much an act of worship. But also true giving is from the heart. As we mentioned in John 4, verse 24, 4, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. That spirit means with the, the right attitude, with sincerity. Now Jesus, who was sitting there in that temple, in Jerusalem, he knew the hearts of those people as they put their money in. Jeremiah 17, verse 30, verse 10, rather, says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, each even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. God knows our hearts. He knows whether we're giving as we've been prospered, whether we're giving wholeheartedly, as, as the Bible says, liberally, Liberality. He knows all that. And here the Lord was and these, with these big chests. They were there and He was observing the, that money probably being poured from a bag or something by some of the wealthy people and it, as it went down, clink, 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 clink. He could see the, the rich that, but here the poor widow put in two mites that barely even made a sound probably as it went in. And He noticed that too. Matthew 6, verse 21, the Lord says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now the wealthy probably drew applause when they, when they uh, gave for their contribution. 
But who applied the widow's contribution? The Lord did. God applauded her contribution. Philippians 4, verse 18. Paul writes of the gift that he had received, the contribution he had received from Philippi. He said, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. He knew they had sacrificed to send him whatever amount it was, and it probably wasn't a whole lot. But he knew that. Well, what? Uh, where had some of that wealth come from? Where had they gotten some of their money? You can read in verse 40 of chapter 12 of Mark. Jesus later would say of the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees, he says, which devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. And Jesus talks about this other places too, how they would uh, trick widows into giving them their property. <clears throat> saying, oh, it's going for the good work here. It's going for the temple or something like that. For a pretense, devour widows' houses. Today, or when we contribute again, will we give with the right heart? 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. He's doing this willingly. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And as that could literally be translated, God loveth a hilarious giver. This giver is gladly giving what they are giving. Revelation 2, verse 23, Jesus speaking there says, all the churches which know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts, I will give unto every one according to their works. The Lord sees what we give, doesn't he? If we're giving as we have been prospered. But also, the, <clears throat> in verses 43 and 44, let's just read this again in Mark 12. He says, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than all they that cast into the treasury, for they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want. Notice that. Her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Now the Lord was not condemning the rich for giving. He wasn't condemning that at all. Yet he rejected the idea that big people have, even today, that uh, your generosity, your, your attitude toward God is measured by the amount of your gift. How much you give. I remember going to a Christian college many years ago and they would announce very publicly about brother so-and-so has given the school so many thousands or a million dollars. Oh, and oh, it was a big deal. So this was a Christian college at that time. And uh, I thought about all the widows and not so well off people that may have given sacrificially to help out that school, and they didn't get all that acclaim. But those who gave a big amount did. You know, their, their large contributions, the rich people there in the temple, were but of the excess of their wealth. They weren't sacrificing anything. They were taking a little bit of the cream off the top. And that was it. It was small compared to what they really could have done, actually could have done. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. And this is what that widow did. She fulfilled that very verse when you think about it. She must have felt that her gift was kind of insignificant compared to those that were before her or followed her in comparison. A, a mite, well, let's back up here. A laborer's wage for a day was equivalent in our money to 16 cents. That's not much. And two mites was about one-fourth of a cent in our money. And it was usually a little bronze coin that was smaller than a, than a dime. 
And uh, it was a very small amount of money. And here she gives that freely. But Jesus contrasts her sacrifice with the wealthies. Wealthies. See, Jesus had scales in his way of thinking. And in his, on his scale, she cast in more than all that had been given that day. And who knows how much money was given that day because some of these people were probably wealthy. She cast in, notice what he says here in verse 44. She cast in all that she had, A-L-L, -L, all of her living. Probably all that she had to give that day. She may have missed me a meal or meals that day because of what she gave. But the rich, what they get out of? They gave out of their abundance. And he says, she out of her want. What a contrast. Proverbs 13, verse 7 says, there is, there is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. That is a good commentary on that passage. Proverbs 13, verse 7. Our thing we need to ask ourselves as Christians is, what group do we fall in? What group do we fit in? You know, brethren, sacrificial giving is the hallmark of New Testament Christianity. I remember years ago, this is when I was a child, at the, it used to be called the Lubbock, the uh, Sunset School of Preaching, it's called something else now. But the story goes, there was a student there, or the wife of a student, they don't know who it was, and they were taking up a contribution to help some missionary somewhere or something. She put in her wedding ring. And uh, I always thought that, <clears throat> that always moved me. That was many years ago. Acts 4 verse 32 says that the early Christians and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that the ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1 and 2. Paul tells the brethren, he says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. Paul here talking about what's called the Great Collection, where he was gathering money up to take to Jerusalem to the poor saints to help them from all the different churches there that he knew of, especially the Gentile churches. He goes on and says, How that in much proof of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their... Deep poverty abounded into the riches of their liberality. American Standard Version. Brethren, that type of giving that the widow did is a type of giving that supported countless preachers of the gospel in their work. It's a type of giving which has sent forth missionaries into distant lands. It's a type of giving that has built church buildings that we have to this day. It's a type of giving that has fed the hungry and clothed the orphan and that has circled the planet with tracts and books and DVDs and videos and publications by faithful brethren. That's what that type of giving has done. Now what are our reasons for giving? What was her reasons for giving? You know, Christian giving should not be done out of just a desire to obey. I remember my grandparents were a member of a denomination. What well, was the Baptist Church? Little town, and they didn't go much a couple times a year, but every month they got a, a, a note from their church for their tithe, what they owed the church. Now that's not biblical at all. But sometimes brethren do it well. I better, I better, you know, I've, I've got to do this. But we should give out of a desire of thankfulness. John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll do what I've commanded. The Lord said. The Lord realized, and we should realize, 
that all we have, everything in this life, from the clothes we wear to the food we just ate, is a gift from God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 26. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In Acts 14, verse 17, one of my favorite, Paul told a bunch of pagans there at Antioch Pisidia, or was it uh, Lystra? Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and he gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and glass. So God's given all this stuff, so why should we thankfully give back? God in His love, remember, was the first giver. John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Christ, out of His love, gave all to the Christian. He became a human being, as we talked about in Bible class this morning. Philippians 2, verse 7, Hath made Himself of no reputation, took upon Him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. The Lord gave by living a perfect example for us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow in His steps, who did not sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. The Lord gave by being the perfect sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. That is giving. And of course, Jesus also gave us a perfect way of salvation or gospel. First, Second Corinthians 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that through His poverty you might be rich. Brother, we need to ask ourselves, <clears throat> how much... Is salvation worth to me? How much is avoiding heaven and gaining, uh, avoiding, pardon me, avoiding hell and gaining heaven? How much is that worth? Matthew 19, verse 21, Jesus told the rich young ruler, If thou would be perfect or complete, go and sell what thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Heaven is worth much more than anything that you've got in this world, he told that man. And what was the Lord return? What does God give us return for that loving obedience? He blesses us. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosoms. You may say, well, preacher, I understand that, but I don't have much to give. I don't make a lot of money. I'm on a limited income, whatever it may be. Illustration here by Brother Burton Kaufman, one of his commentaries on uh, Mark. He wrote these words many years ago. He said, The city of New York was participating in a campaign among the immigrant poor of the great city to raise funds for the construction of the pedestal and supporting tower upon which the Statue of Liberty would be erected. It was built over in France, and they brought it over here. They said, we've got to have a base, a pedestal for that to be on. And, and so they decided to have a campaign. This is probably about <clears throat> 1890. The campaign was lagging until a poor woman sold her bed for $13 and contributed the money. Inspired that by that, the people quickly responded and gave more than was needed. In a similar manner, the poor widow of this text has constructed many a church building and subscribed many a budget all over the world. How true that is. We say, well, you know, I haven't got much to give. Well, give it and give more. Have we, have you and I been giving to the Lord and His work lately? Are we like the rich in Jesus' eyes? Are we just giving from our excess? Or are we like that poor widow? We should never forget, brethren, that when we give and when we sing and when we pray and when we listen, Jesus is watching. Acts 20, verse 35, Paul says, I have shown you all things that so laboring you ought to support the weak. To remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how He said it is more blessed to give than to receive. 
And this poor widow was truly, truly blessed that day for the Son of God to comment about her for all of us to read 2,000 years later. There may be someone today that has not become a Christian. Why not do that today to believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess Him as Lord, and be baptized into Christ for the mission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38. To rise up to walk in newness of life, and then now you can give if you have been prospered. If this is your need today. Please come as we stand and sing. That's 718. I give you the wrong number. I give you the closing song. 718. Who at the door is standing? Let us sing. Who at the door is standing? Patiently drawing near. In front of the